So it's herbs for the health of it. And as a courtesy, since we also need to share this with our audience that will be um, watching the video, this is through the Yavapai County Master Gardeners Association. We have two offices, one in Prescott, most of you know this already, and the other one is in Verde Valley. The good news is they're open for business. So if you do have any gardening questions, you can email, you can call, and you can bring your your plants in, but make sure they're in a plastic bag so that we don't have bugs rolling around the um, or diseases in the in the offices. We have three ways you can communicate with us. We have our Master Gardener website, um, our Speakers Bureau email, and Facebook. And the Speakers Bureau email is what I monitor. So if you ever have any questions about the presentations that I am giving here. You can uh, email me at ycmgspeakersbureau at gmail.com. At the subject line, put attention Lauren, so I know it's directed to me, and I will do my best to, to get an answer back to you. So I try to answer, you know, a lot of times after a presentation, you like, I wish I would have answered this, or if we run out of time. So part of our uh, mission as a master gardener is to educate and answer questions, and whether it's here, online, or by phone, that's that's what we do so tonight we're talking about herbs and we will not cover every herb we could possibly use but I'm gonna basically be covering those that are more likely that we would grow and use here and it's going to start with um, a topic of um, what um, why we're using herbs we're gonna talk about how to store and freeze them. We're gonna talk then about herbs specifically. And then at the end, some fun ideas of what you can do from the bounty from your garden, from your harvest. So why do we grow herbs? Um, they're fragrant, they're flavorful. Um, they can be one of the most important things for health. You know, as we salt our food and we put sugar and fats to make it more tasty, well, guess what? That's all bad for us and we can use the herbs in place of and actually get a much more flavorable, flavorable dish if you use the herbs correctly. You may still need to add a little salt, but I don't know if you know this, as we get older, our taste buds start deteriorating. And so what used to be like, it doesn't have enough salt on it because that taste bud has diminished over time with our age. So instead of adding more salt, which is not good for our blood pressure, um, I encourage you to look at using herbs that can substitute flavors that you're looking for. Um, what happens with herbs is they contain, all of them contain essential oils. Um, and you know, just like lavender, you can get the little oils, um, and that's crushed leaves. So the essential oils in every herb comes out when either you crush it, you cut it, or you cook it. Now most of the time cooking, will diminish the, the flavor of the herb, but some of them actually enhance it. Um, the other thing is herbs, um, I didn't really cover a lot of it in this, but every herb has some medicinal value. And I was amazed as I was researching this, it's like rosemary, oh my gosh, all the things that it, it cures, I, now I'm gonna start using more rosemary. But it's not just the flavor that you're replacing, but it's something that's good for your digestive system, your immune system. So find herbs that you like, and I encourage you to grow them in your yard because picking a couple leaves off and cooking with them is the best way to get the most out of that herb versus dried from the store. The other thing with herbs, um, I incorporate them in my gardens. Um, so with my vegetables, um, we, I think for those who sat through my plant to plate class, we have companion planting. So some of the herbs, um, because of the smell, ward off the pests. And so um, uh, basil, for instance, is one of the best things to grow in your yard if you don't want mosquitoes, just like the plant, whatever it is. Citronelle, yeah, thank you. Um, if you plant onions or any a part of the onion family around roses, aphids don't like the smell. So your, your herbs can also benefit the other plants that you're growing in the garden. So instead of having just an herb garden, Plant your herbs amongst other things that you're, you're growing, and they will be beneficial to those plants. The other thing is herbs, most herbs, not all, will produce flowers. Now, sometimes the moment it produces flowers, it diminishes 
the flavor of the plant, but some, many of the flowers are also edible. And so they create, and they also attract pollinators. So I always try to let some things flower to bring the, bring the pollinators back into my garden. And whether it's an onion that I leave over the winter, so it's the first thing that's flowering in the spring, um, bringing the, the bees right into my garden immediately. So use herbs for all sorts of purposes, but tonight we're gonna talk about why we're eating them. Um, herb flowers, so basil, bee balm, cilantro, chives, dill, fennel, garlic, all of those flowers are as edible as the leaves that we're either using fresh or drying um, and using in our cooking. And some of the petals, some of the flowers have more flavor than the leaves. Again, they may bring the, the, the leaves may deteriorate once they flower, but the flowers themselves will actually add more enhancement. And they're pretty to put on your plate. Um, I actually will let some of my oregano flowers bloom because I like those buds. It's much more intense in the, and a little goes a long way. So instead of say a teaspoon of oregano, if I have flowers and I chop those buds up, I'm using a quarter of a teaspoon. So you have to learn which herbs have more intensity in your flowers versus your leaves. Um, as far as anise, the flowers are edible. Um, they have a lighter anise flavor than the leaves, but they are great for garnish, addition to salad. And the other nice thing with anise is they make a great tea. So um, basil flowers, we talked about a little bit. They, you can put, easily put them on your uh, pasta salads. Um, and once they go into full bloom, it will affect the basil leaves that remain. So I always like to try to pick my flowers out of the basil plant as soon as they just set slightly open. And the fennel flowers um, have a licorice flavor. Fennel is more licorice. And again, all parts of the fennel uh, plant are edible, including the seeds, stem stalks, leaves, bulbs, and flowers. So. Um, depending on what flavors you're looking for, these two plants go a long way. And basil is like the number one plant used, herb used in cooking. Er, oregano is next. So we have a variety of different herbs. You know, people think about herbs, and I, I think most people think that they're annuals. And you grow them, and you have to next year plant new ones. There are a lot more perennials than you can believe. Um, the biannuals will last for a couple of years. Parsley is, and cilantro are two of those. And cilantro and parsley have a wide variety of plants that are like them. Marjoram is one of them. Cilantro, as we'll learn about, is also produces, um, uh, it's near, it's, it's like some other plants that we use the seeds for. So cilantro is also called Chinese parsley. It looks like it. We have a lot of, um, and chervil is another one that looks like parsley. They all have a little distinctive flavor. Parsley, believe it or not, is more, has a stronger flavor than some of its other partners. And cilantro, if you've had cilantro in your Mexican dishes, it's got a very unique flavor also. Some people like cilantro, some people don't. Um, the annuals for our climate um, that grow well are marjoram, lemongrass, basil, and dill. Um, what's, for me, I have my basil in pots. I have a lot of my items in pots, some of them because of the root systems. I bring them in the garage in the winter, and my basil plant continues for a couple of years as long as I don't let it die off. Um, you have to be careful for a lot of our herbs because their root systems will take over your garden, such as mint, uh, tarragon. So some of those you might, might want to consider putting in pots so that you don't wipe out your other flowering plants. Um, your annuals, um, biennials and short-lived perennials, is fennel would be one of them. Um, the nice thing about fennel, if you let it go to flower, it will reproduce itself in the spring. And the fennel, both the, the herb variety with the leaves and seeds are edible, but then they also have the bulbs, and it's a mild 
mild type onion. So um, with a little bit licorice flavor in it. So your hardy uh, perennials for this area are oregano, thyme, rosemary, lavender, sage, and if you're gonna plant some new plant in your yard, September would be a good time to do it. It's enough time for the root system to get established, so it's ready to go in the spring. Um, I have all of these in my yard, and the one thing I do is I, I like to give gifts of, of my herbs as Christmas presents, and I also make vinegars and oils, which we'll talk about. So I do a lot of pruning during the season, but at the end of the year, I take most of the leaves off. But I put, we talked about frost cloth for all of you who are in my class. Um, I just wrap some frost cloth around my plants in the winter. They don't die off, so they come back a lot faster in the spring. So, so you can do them outdoors then? Yep, yep. So my... Um, well, it has to be a perennial. So oregano, thyme, rosemary, lavender, sage are all really easy to grow. You, um, they don't produce year round, but the root system stays intact. How do you protect them in the winter? Well, if you don't do anything, you just cut it back. It has to be an established root system. But if you, you know, even if you don't have frost cloth, one thing I did earlier was I put uh, leaves from the trees and I put them around the roots. And then, you know, the, buck, the black containers when you buy a plant from the nursery, put that upside down over the root system and it's got its own little insulated system. But when I use frost cloth, because the sunlight comes through it, I actually can go out in the winter, my sage and uh, um, oregano will, will produce all year long, as long as it, it's protected from the frost. So frost cloth being it keeps it um, down to 16 degrees frost cloth and you know Home Depot sells one variety but if you go to gardenersupply.com you can get very lightweight to extremely heavy weight and so depending what you're using it for um, highly recommend it I, I buy it by yards hundreds of yards so um, and then we have the herbaceous which are perennials the difference is from the top, they have no woody stems. So chives is a, and mint um, are a perfect example. The chives will come back every year, but they are just green coming out of the ground. There is no wood that associates. And the interesting thing is, we'll talk about some plants. Once the wood gets overabundant, the leaves on the plant, they still will produce, and it will look like a ornamental, but the, the flavor of the leaves after many years diminishes. So they suggest after three to four years of a woody plant like sage. Um, you can keep it in your garden, but if you want really good flavor, plant a new plant. So the wood um, takes away from the, the growth of the leaves in terms of the flavor. So the other option is to grow herbs indoors. Um, if you are growing, things in pots outdoors and you say well I'll just bring it in the house be careful because part of the the natural soil system has um, bugs <laughs> little gnats um, and just things that work the soil and when you bring them in the house and water them for a couple weeks you'll have black bugs flying all over the house so what I do is I bring my plants in the garage. Um, I have invested in some grow lights. I have a really small grow light under one of my counters. Um, you can always start things from seed, and I would suggest you buy uh, small bags in, that are indoor nursery uh, uh, dirt bags rather than the outside, like miracle Grow that are in the big bags, um, because they will not contain any insects in them. So you have sterilized soil that you can begin with, and you can actually start your seeds from scratch indoors, and then in spring, move them outdoors. But if you are gonna bring pots in, put them in your garage and get them. Um, one thing that works is um, your linen, your sheets that you put in your dryer. Um, bugs don't like the smell of it. Um, the, um, 
mothballs you can put around the dirt. I've actually put cloves in my dirt and then I put just a plastic bag up around the base of the plant covering the dirt and I let it for about one month sit in there and the, and the you still can water your plant but it'll kill off the bugs. So just be aware. Um, so if you are going to grow inside, plants that do really good inside are rosemary and thyme, um, basil, marjoram, oregano, and sage. Um, and, and then parsley, coriander, shrivel, and basil are easy to start from the seeds from scratch. Now, you could either do a pot and have a variety. When you're indoors, you really are only growing for what you want to use for cooking sort of immediate. So having too much of one herb is probably going to go to waste unless you just keep picking it and drying it and, and, or freezing it. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. How do you have for the grow light? Does it have to be a specific type of bulb or can you just use a fluorescent? You can't use a fluorescent. It has to have a UV that goes from blue to red. So um, like a full, I, spectrum full spectrum. And some spectrums are for seed growing and some for uh, the leaves. So depending on what you're, if you're just starting everything from seed, you want, I think it's blue spectrum. Mm -hmm. but. You know, you can get a small mounted under your cabinet fixture from Amazon for 35 bucks. Okay. And I have a series of th four grow lights, three foot lights in the back of my garage, all hooked up into a maze. Mm -hmm. And I bring my tomato pots and my pepper pots in in, in October before the frost. Mm -hmm. And that will produce fruit until January. Mm -hmm. and, and usually what happens is it's just, it doesn't freeze in the garage, but it, it's cold enough that the plants go into dormancy. My one pepper plant, my bell pepper, I'm on my fifth year of one plant. Wow. And, um, and um, so you just bring them in I bring them in. And if it's nice outside, we even put them on little uh, rollers, you know, and I roll them out to the front of the garage if it's nice out. Tomatoes, um, again, we talked about this as poll pollination. You do not need a bee to pollinate a tomato you need an electric toothbrush mm -hmm. because the way tomatoes pollinate themselves is through the wind and, vi and if bees fly around it, the vibration, but it's not the actual bee transferring pollen. So my yellow little pear tomato plant is on its end of its second year. It produced tomatoes all year round in my garage mm -hmm. and I just kept it trimmed back a little bit. So. How does it work for what? So if, if it's in your garage, uh -huh. is it getting sunlight? Well, I have grow lights. Oh, so it has the U light. UV light. Okay, gotcha. Yep. So as long as you have the control part. Correct. And I turn my UV lights on from midnight to 7, 8 o'clock in the morning because the coldest part of the evening is early morning. And so it gets its, natu it gets its sunlight late at night, and that also gives some warmth. Mm -hmm. I also have a, um, one of those high towers that I can, I can just turn on depending on the temperature. And it's not right next to the plant, but it moves the air around and it gives off a little heat, not too much, but it keeps the garage warm. I just hold it near, if you see a bud on a, on a tomato plant, you just hold it. You don't want to hit the plant with your toothbrush, but you just hold the toothbrush and turn it on, and the vibration near it will uh, self, allow it to self-pollinate. Can't you just shake the plant? You can, you can, but you might also damage it. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I have a bunch of landscapers, weed Suppression cloth, can I use that for frost? Nope, no. nope. A couple things. Um, the idea for frost cloth outside is that it allows UV rays in. And so um, if you just put your landscaper cloth on, it doesn't have the, uh, de the protection for freezing, but it also won't let any sunlight in. So my strawberry beds, I cover the whole thing with frost cloth. They won't produce during the winter because it's just too cold but they don't die, and by when I take it off in March, I had strawberries in the beginning of April, and I keep the frost cloth on 
And um, I go from a really heavy frost cloth to a lighter frost cloth, just in case we get a, a, a overnight frost. But there, you know, I'm not starting from scratch. So, um, and then I, because we have squirrels and rabbits, I have cages, so a lot of times I put the frost cloth over my cages. I grew spinach all winter long with a, la a layer of frost cloth, and um, it was robust. It grew, it grew from October to March. So you don't really need like a, a, a little greenhouse over it? No. Nope. Really yeah. So, all right, so a couple things about growing herbs indoors. You wanna use clean porous potting mix, no fertilizer, um, one of the things about fertilizer, it, it super activates the green leaves growing and you really don't want to have these small plants in your kitchen going crazy. Um, you also want to keep it thinned if you're doing from seeds, to make sure the pot is not overpopulated with too many seeds. Now, this is hard in our area, but humidity should be between 30 and 50 percent. Now. Generally, that's difficult, but then in the winter, when there is, you have the heat on and it's a drying condition. So I have a little humidifier in my kitchen that I just sort of run, and that seems to work. Um, spray your foliage, because that keeps them happy. The grow light, and if you don't have a grow light, and you, it needs sunlight, but if you put it right in front of the window, you could cook your plants and they could burn because of the refraction of the light. So be careful for that. The indoor temperature should be in the low 70s and it does need airflow, but it doesn't want the direct, if you put it under a vent and you get the heat or, or air conditioning, that also will uh, deter the plant from growing. So they do need specific conditions to grow when you think about trying to do this. <laughs> Um, so other things to think about for herbs, there's the best time to harvest. Whether it's herbs or anything else, it's always in the morning. Um, it's cooler. Um, and the herbs you want the dew to actually evaporate. Now, the other thing is if you are going to harvest from herbs that are outside, <laughs> wash them because you've had maybe birds pooping on them, they're dust, because you don't want to just pick something up, dry it, and now it's in your herb bottle to use because you're getting all that, all that other stuff that you wouldn't want to eat in it. So um, the air dry, we're going to talk in detail about these different things, but air drying um, is probably the most common where we're going to bundle. Um, I took an old shoe stand that had just wire racks and it was a great thing just to clip on bundles. So I have uh, four different levels on two sides. It works great. Um, you have some, if they don't have the sprigs to tie up, and it's just leaves, um, like let's say sage, you might want to air dry them flat. Um, a quick way is, and I think it's on the next one, you can microwave them, but you have to be very careful that you don't cook them. And then some, the best thing to do is use a dehydrator, um, just because of the type of plant it is. So the other thing for storing fresh herbs, um, I have some pictures here. You want to make sure they're moist. So the best thing to do is find a, you know, plastic wine, old, you know, short wine cup and put them in a plastic bag so that they put them in the refrigerator. And these can, it says up to five days, I've had my fresh herbs last up to a, two weeks by using this method. And you know, if you have some herbs and you pick too many, or you had to pick them because they were going to flower, this is a, and you want to use them fresh, this is a great method to use. Or if you buy them from the store, another, another good method. Air drying. So um, this works best for most herbs that have minimal water in their leaves. And it's like, like what is that? Well, it's the tiny, the smaller leaves like oregano and thyme. Um, most of them will have a sprig on them. Um, bay, we're going to talk a little bit about bay leaves themselves, so I won't get into that too much. But dill, it's very thin, lacy, so they don't hold a lot of moisture. Um, I find that sage does not do well with air drying as, as other ones, so I like to use the flatter method. 
um, when you air dry, you're not doing anything to diminish the oils that are still in the leaves. So when you do it this method and then you put the leaves in an airtight container and use them within a reasonable amount of time, you'll get the most flavor from them. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, you go to the store and you buy something that's been on the shelf for I don't know how long and then you put it in your cabinet and a year later you still have it and you open it up. If you smell it, you can't even smell the flavors. So another thing, if you buy herbs from the store, small containers, um, unless you're doing major cooking and you buy the big parsley things from Costco, it'll, it'll go bad before you ever go through it. Um, if you're, when you pick out the branches that you're going from the garden, get the healthy branches. Anything that's diseased, take those leaves off. Take out your dead leaves because when you dry the good leaves, you will not be able to tell the difference between the good leaves and the bad leaves. So take all the bad leaves off before you start your, your process. Um, again, we talked about rinsing with cold water to remove the dust and dry them very good with the paper towels before you hang them. And this is where you can dry in the microwave. It says two to three minutes. I found I do a minute and then I go 30 seconds at a time so it doesn't get overcooked. Um, and it'll get brittle, but you don't, you don't want to get it too hot because overheated and cooked because then it starts taking the flavor out. So, um, the best way of air drying is you're going to gather, you're not going to crunch them all together into one big wad. You're going to put about four to six sprigs together. I just use a cotton twine and then um, I usually use those black clips for holding paper together. I just clip them onto a rod that I have and hang them. The, the oregano and thyme will take three, four days to air dry to when I use them. Now some of these, uh, dill for one, when they dry their, their le little leaves will fall off. So some of these you might want to put in a paper bag and clip them to the top of the bag so that it's easier to just take them all off in the bag instead of being all over a counter or, or uh, whatever medium you're putting them on. Paper bag, uh, paper bag, and then just I like I loosely clip them on the top. Yeah, it's still open, and don't don't dry these near the sun. Again, sun heat will remove your flavors, and. Once, you full, once they're fully dry and you remove the leaves, they need to be in an airtight container. So, you know, just like I save a lot of my vitamin bottles. And I like the darker ones, the ones that um, rather than clear because it also keeps light out of them. But just take the labels off and then always label your herbs of when you, when you dried and, and put them in a container. So at least you know, okay, it's six months old, they're starting to diminish. Um, either use them or get rid of them. Um, then we have the frozen. There's two frozen leaf methods. Uh, the first, there's actually three. Um, this is harvesting really fresh leaves. Um, the first method is to spread the leaves out on a, cook, a small co cookie tray or some kind of tray where you can put in your freezer and you let them freeze about a week is what I do. Um, and then these are, you don't want to put them then into a plastic bag because you probably want, want to keep them flat and whole because as soon as you start crunching them, you start releasing your essential oils and the flavors. So, you know, these little plastic, uh, glad plastic containers, Put them in there, put them in the freezer, and just take out a leaf as you need to. The other method of freezing is basil's a perfect thing like this. Basil does, n and this is all going to be posted, by the way, so um, I'm going to give Ava the PowerPoint and she can give it to you guys. Um, basil is a, does not dry well, so what I do is I chop it up and I will actually put it, we have one with, I put it in my olive oil, but here you can put leaves in with water. The interesting thing is 
because these leaves are so lightweight, if you put them in the tray and then you put water, they'll all float up to the top. So the recommendation is you only put half, fill the tray half with water, let that freeze and then put water on the top because then all the leaves will be covered with water because they won't float, float up on the second freeze. If that makes sense. Um, you want to use the, the herbs you're freezing this way. You want to use those when you're doing soups, stew, uh, soups, stews, casseroles, things that if you add a little bit water, it won't matter because when, it def when you put them in a pot, it's, go it's going to melt. Um, and I always put, I measure how much I'm using. So it calls for a, if it's a tablespoon, I measure a tablespoon or a teaspoon. So I make sure that if my recipe calls for a teaspoon, I'm not putting in more than I should. So I take all the things out of my ice cream tray. I put them in a baggie. And on the baggie, it says, I froze them on this date. The cubes have, you know, two tables, two teaspoons of whatever. And I did it on this date. And don't put it way down in the bottom of the freezer because you're going to forget about it. And then you'll just throw them away. Um, this is where uh, some of your herbs, chives go well, uh, work well with this. Um, even onions, uh, the greens of on green tops of the onions. Um, but the nice thing about olive oil, it's denser. So you can put your herbs in the tray, you fill it with oil, and the oil doesn't keep the herbs from flo floating on the top. And so, um, and it looks like you got them in butter, but it works quite well. Um, the other thing with basil, you can make your, pe if you're going to use it for pesto, you can chop it up and put your pine nuts in um, or whatever seasonings, put some oil in and freeze it in baggies. And, and all you, just don't, you don't add the cheese, usually it's Parmesan goes with your uh, pesto, don't add the cheese until after you take it out to defrost it to make the pesto. But, you know, if you don't want to waste your herbs, this is a great method. I would recommend using it within six months. Um, just almost anything, you, if it's in the freezer too long. And the other thing on some of mine, I will double bag it into a Ziploc bag because some, uh, depending if you have the heavy duty freezer bags or not. So if it's not the really heavy duty freezer, put it in double bags. So now we're going to talk about alphabetical order so you can see where we are. Um, now, bay leaves. The tree is native to the Mediterranean. Most herbs that we use are native to the Mediterranean region. And South France, um, Italy, um, Spain. So you, I have friends who grow bay trees here, and they're small. So they use frost cloth and cover them during the winter, but they will lose their leaves. The interesting thing is when we talk about drying leaves, and you, you buy bay leaves, they're in a... Um, a bag or they're in their whole leaves in a bottle. When they dry on the tree, right about the time they're ready to fall off the tree, is the perfect time to pick them. Give them another week drying before because they're not on the ground with bugs, and then just put them in a sealed container. Um, if you want, if you get too many, you can give them to friends, or you can freeze them in a container in the freezer. Now, if you have a bay tree, um, you're going to get a lot of leaves, so you probably don't need to freeze them because you'll never be without leaves except for during the winter. Um, they have a menthol-like scent and taste, and they really, if, you've, if you've cooked with bay leaves, they really bring out flavor in your stews and your soups. They are not to be eaten. They are there to be cooked, and the flavors permeate into what you're cooking. Uh, so. A lot of times when we're making herb packets to cook, bay leaves are one of the ingredients in it, and it's always good to put it in cheesecloth or something that you can remember to take out before you start mixing everything else in. Excuse me. Um, and I think that's all for bay leaves. So basil, again, one of the most aromatic and most commonly used herbs in the U.S. Did you know it wards off mosquitoes? 
Um, a lot of our herbs do, but this is one that mosquitoes do not like. So having like pots of, er, of er, herbs and say basil around your patio where you might be sitting is a great way of having beauty and protecting yourself. Uh, it grows really quickly in warm climates, so it can go up to two feet high. One of my friends who's a master gardener has a big wine barrel and it is literally her basil, she starts with, from seeds, it is filling it up. So I have one tiny basil plant. When I need basil, I just go to her house. So um, when it's flowering, you want to pinch it down three to four leaves of, of solid leaves just so that it has enough growth and it's not just one or two. But you can then use the flowers and you can le use the leaves for cooking and or your salads or anything else. Um, it does need some type of sun or UV if it's grown indoor and you really need to pinch it back more often because it'll go out of control in your kitchen or wherever you're growing. And basil has, and I think everybody knows what basil is, right? So it's sweet, pungent flavor, and we love it with tomatoes and Italian food, and um, that is one of the ones that works well with the freezing with the oil um, of your taste. Chives, um, very prolific. Do people grow, ch have you guys grown chives? So once it goes to flower, the next year you will get hundreds of little chive plants. I learned the hard way. I keep my chives in pots and I don't keep them in the midst of my other garden. So they are sitting out on some rocks or away from other plants so I don't infest my dirt. And it's really hard to pull those little suckers out when they come up in the spring. I mean, you think it's these little, just tiny little grass strips, but the bulbs and stuff are really embedded in the ground. So um, don't plant even with like I put it the pots next to my my um, roses and it does its job but as soon as they come to flower I'll move them away so um, has a very mild onion flavor goes great with omelets dip salad especially cream soups soups and sprinkling it on potatoes etc and like green onions, it doesn't freeze well just as a long thing, so you need to chop it up and put it in oils or water. Cherville um, is one of the plants, there's a lot that, that resemble parsley. Um, it will reseed itself as the flower matures. It's, it's not that common around here. I have seen it in specialty stores. I think Waters carries it. Um, it's used a lot for garnish, although I find that parsley is cheaper because this is more of an exotic herb. Um, you can chop it, you can air dry it, freeze it. It has a little overtones of licorice and it's more considered an herb to, comp to blend and complement with another herb. So it brings out other flavors, but typically it's too mild on its own to be a standalone in a dish. And again, things that it goes well with is omelets, salad sauces, um, good with fish dishes when it's complemented with another. Um, the nice thing about this is it can add some flavor, but it's not overpowering. So um, some of our herbs will say a little goes a long way. Instead of a teaspoon, you add a quarter of a teaspoon because it's so strong. This doesn't have that limit. Cilantro. So coriander when the coriander seeds that is the seeds from our cilantro it's also known as chinese parsley um, it's related to the parsley family um, but it has such a distinct flavor i love parsleys and all that i can't stand cilantro for some reason so i don't cook it <laughs> and and grow it but um, it is an herb that is best when it is fresh and if you're going to buy a bunch at the store, place them in the water in a cup, seal the bag, and it's the only way it'll stay fresh. If you just put them in your, in your produce drawer, they'll wilt within a couple days. Um, it's great. The chopping is what releases the flavor. Many of these, you, the leaves, until they're broken up, 
you won't get, you won't smell or taste the sensation. So that's why you see um, cilantro chopped up in salsas, for instance. So it's it's common. It's used in Mexican food, Chinese, Indian, and Thai, and it's an essential ingredient of ceviche. Dill, beautiful plant. Um, it is. They call it the plant that keeps on giving. I just had a quick question with uh, cilantro. Cilantro, yeah. When's the ideal time to plant it with FMC? Because I always find like once it starts to get warm, it. Well, it for people who work in, and um, it's not going to be live this time, but in, in August our Zoom presentations will be on seed saving okay. and growing, which means then in September it'll be on the YouTube with the library. But to answer your question, most master gardeners start their seed growing in February, March. Okay. And um, you have to sort of look at the seed to see how long the um, uh, propagation is. And, but you typically, for young plants, don't want to plant them until outside, until you have no frost. And in this area, we can have frost up to Mother's Day. It hasn't been. We've had it. But um, if you have frost cloth, then you don't have to worry because you just put frost cloth over everything. I usually have my seedlings go out in the middle of uh, April. And um, so I'll start growing around March 1st. But you have to look at the seeds to see how long they germinate. And, and then you have to harden your plants off. So just because if you're growing them inside, you just don't take them and then put them outside. You have to give them like for a week to two weeks, you expose them outdoors, first just to the outdoors, and then to a little sun, and then a little bit more sun. Um, Would you use frost, frost cloth as you're exposing them? Um, depends on the weather. Okay. The, the, the biggest thing for exposing your plants is too much sun, and they're so tiny that you can just dry them out okay. within a couple hours. Gotcha. So, um, but dill, it's, Everything about dill, you can eat. The flowers are good. Um, the leaves are good. The stems. It's peak, it's, and this is one of the few plants that its peak flavor is when it goes to flower. So it, it, you can still use the dill leaves and cut them and put them in your, in your sauces or fish. But um, its best flavor is right at that time it flowers. So if you're going to store them, and, you, and this would be another plant that really would go good with the freezing method rather than the drying method. That would be a good time to harvest it if you're going to store it for a period of time. Um, and the dill has a um, lemony caraway flavor and it goes good with, I love it with fishes and dips, um, potato dishes. And then you can use the seeds, that's the primary um, what you use for pickling. So if you don't, if you're not going to go to the store and buy seeds for pickling you and you're growing this, those seeds right there are exactly what goes into any kind of pickling. And I grow banana peppers and they're prolific. And the dill plant works quite well with that. And then we have mint. Now mint is, this is my, one of my mint plants, secure in a pot. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, um, there's uh, spearmint and peppermint are the most common. The spearmint is what's typically sold at the store and is what's used generally for cooking uh, your, your cook dishes. Peppermint is more for candy making, uh, drinks, um, and more of this, it's really strong. So it's what are you using that you're going to, um, icing for, for, um, if you're blending something in for cakes, it's a good dish. I actually got chocolate mint, which smells wonderful, and it tastes great. So I use my chocolate mint for desserts, um, mostly, because um, what you can't go wrong with chocolate flavors. Um, it, again, even this I keep cut back, because if it sends out shooters, it will quickly find the dirt, and it just invades the space of the rest of the plants. Um, it's one of the plants, I, I will bring this in to the garage, so it keeps growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. And I can use it during the winter, so I just, again, it's just snipping off leaves as I'm cooking. 
Um, when you go to the store, you can get mint in extract form, obviously dried in bottles, and you can get it fresh. Now, to me, fresh, the only reason I'm using it extract is if I'm cooking cookies or something and I need to throw something in, but otherwise I usually just use the fresh mint. Um, cooking does dramatically reduce the flavor of the mint. So one of the things they recommend when you're, if you're adding it, say you're doing lamb because mint goes with lamb, you don't start with the mint marinating with the lamb right away. You put it on in its last, um, if it's cooking for two hours, you're going to put it on the last 20 minutes. So you don't, you want to keep that mint flavor. So overcooking it will just deteriorate it entirely. Um, and I think you, there's just a variety of things that you can put mint on and it's sort of like what are your taste buds looking for. And then it's our age-old standby. We have French and Italian parsley. The difference is the French has the dark curly leaves and the Italian has plain flat leaves. Um, what we're seeing down here is more of the curly leaves, so that would be your, your French. Um, the brighter the, the green leaves, the bright green leaves have, in both plants, will have a sharper peppery flavor, and as they start diminishing in color, that flavor also diminishes. Um, you can use them both fresh and dried. Um, they are great in stews and soups. I mean, I, I have, that's the one thing I can use a big jar, and I keep the jars that I got from Costco, and I just keep refilling them from my own garden, but I am constantly out of garlic and oregano when I cook, or garlic, I'm parsley, I'm sorry, and, and garlic. So um, this to me is one of the go-to plants in your garden, and it's pretty and it's easy to grow. And then back to, now we're on oregano. Um, this is very closely re related to sweet marjoram. And um, the, the difference is sweet marjoram is a little bit sweeter. Um, this is from my garden. You can see I have some, some sun issues, but you can see the flowers. I, I was just ready to pick the flowers off, but I wanted to take a picture so you guys could see what the flowers of oregano were. Um, I will prune this plant back probably five times during its growing season during a year. Um, it is, it just is abundant. And it is a perennial. I've had this plant for five years now in my garden. Um, so it's, it's an easy plant to grow as long as you give it some water. It doesn't need, it needs sun, but not a lot of, lot of direct sun. So most of my, um, Sage, oregano, parsley are in an area that gets early morning sun and no afternoon sun. And it, they seem to work a lot better because they more likely not to go to flower because the heat is what brings flowering out. So um, the scent, again, the same thing um, for other things. The drying process lessens the quality of the oregano and it, the it will get um, a little bit bitter, and it gets bitter with the flowers, so there's really the right time to pick it. And we all know what we can do with oregano, right? It's, it's Italian. <laughs> if you like pasta and pizza and vegetables and chicken. Rosemary, um, this is one of, this also is a uh, perennial. Uh, this is from my yard. It, is, it grows all year round and um, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to put frost cloth on it. I just put, I can put a sprig on meat when I'm cooking it. Um, the one thing about drying rosemary, um, if you've tried to do that, it will almost become pine needle-y and so very hard and caustic. So I will dry the rosemary to a point where it's not fully dried and then I put it into um, a coffee grinder. I have a coffee grinder set aside just for herbs, and I, I mince it then, and then I put it in a jar, and it's very fine, and it, but it keeps its, its flavor. And it does, and when you're mincing it before it comes so hard, it, when it does dry up inside, it doesn't have that real caustic feel to it. 
rosemary is to me one of those herbs that it has so many medicinal values. Um, I, I didn't, re until I started doing this presentation, I didn't realize all the things it can do. Improved memory, migraine relief, um, it's anti-inflammatory, digestive and respiratory, it's used for some prevention of cancers. The list goes on and on. I mean, I could have one whole page of its medicinal values. I didn't realize that. I use it. I think I'm going to use more of it because <laughs> um, it's amazing and it tastes good, you know. Um, there are a lot of varieties of rosemary. Mm -hmm. And on my many walks, I saw these beautiful rosemary plants. Some were tall and some were, you know, just being uh -huh. spread. Are most of them or all of them edible? Um, question being, are most of the rosemary plants edible? The, any rosemary plant is edible. There are some that are going to be really um, so strong that they would overpower your food. So uh, upright rosemary, there's, there's the ones that you buy in the herb section, and I know upright is one of them, is it's got the, the flavor of the rosemary, but not the overpowering. Um, I have two upright rosemaries as ornamental plants in my front yard because the deer, it's one of the things the deer don't eat. And so um, I, they grow well, they're low to maintain, but you use it sparingly. And so the, the woody, there are some rosemaries that are very woody. Those are not going to have the flavors as an upright sort of the, um, you might have a wood base, but not the wood structure, woody structure. So, but you're not, you're not, it's not toxic. It just might not be the taste you want. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to cover those, rosemary? Say again? Rosemary, do you have to cover them for winter? Um, you don't have to cover rosemary in the winter. Okay. It's, it's, a per, it's a perennial that stays green. It's like an evergreen, yeah. if you would. Um, again, as you know, if you've, if you've touched rosemary, it stays with you. In fact, I was doing this presentation. I just finished the slide. I had a run over to our HOA for a meeting. And, you know, so you're thinking about rosemary and everything. And the guy said, I'm like, I keep smelling rosemary. And it's like, and the guy next to me had just pruned his rosemary bush and he was permeating it. But it was, and it stuck, he, said, he said it stuck with him for like the entire day. And I know I can work with my rosemary bushes wash my hands and I will still have that smell for hours after. So a little goes a really long way when, when cooking. I did have a question about pruning rosemary bushes. Mm -hmm. A really large rosemary bush in our front yard. Don't shear it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you shear a rosemary bush, it will just get woody. Mm -hmm. So I hand clip everything and I keep it so it's, and an upright rosemary is a bush that will Spanned out and stay branchy, you know, like your well, sprigs. Like a big bush. Yep. And if you shear plants, no matter what, they will they will get very woody inside, and you'll just get little green on on the outside. And that's one way to really destroy a rosemary bush. Okay. Shearing. Shearing is you take your your shear, your clippers and you just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're Upright, the plant called upright rosemary is a much better plant to buy for looks and for, um, for your garden. We're on S's, even though it says common. Um, so, you know, we have a, t sage is a very common plant in our area. And we have autumn sage, we have rust and sage, but those are all ornamental plants. So the sage that we're talking about for herbs is common sage, Salvia officinalis. There are four varieties that are actually herbs for eating. Um, they are the garden, purple, golden, and tricolor. They are very aromatic and they are hardy um, plants. They are woody plants, so by nature they will, ha will create a woody stalk. My stalk on my five-year-old sage plant is probably this this big now it's and I keep it pruned but it's like okay so it's probably time to let it be an ornamental plant 
and create a new one for my, for my herb collection. Um, it grows really well in hot climate weather. You need to water it, but you have to have good drainage because the plant will die if the root system stay too moist. It, it needs to fully drain. Um, and again, it says every three to four years. I'm on my fifth year. The sage still tastes okay, but it's certainly not as, as predominant as when I planted it you know, several years ago. And it can be used fresh or dried. It's good in stuffing, stews, vegetables, fish, chicken. I have a great recipe. Um, and it's white fish, a tilapia base, and uh, prosci prosciutto, and, you, and butter. What doesn't go well with butter? And then at the end, I just throw some fresh sage leaves in, and they, they cook a little bit, but not too much, and the flavors are phenomenal. And the little almonds on the top. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it acts kind of like rosemary? Like, will it last well outside? Is it pretty hard? Yep. And my, even though I take most of my leaves off right around November, I leave some on my sage plant, and it will, again, with the frost cloth on it, it will produce its leaves during the winter. Not, not pre abundant, but I get fresh sage all during the winter when I need it. And that's if you use the frost cloth? Yes. Then it's like, so almost every sage, I have a variety of sage because I have butterfly gardens and bee gardens, and I cut all my sage back to like this far off the ground, and the bushes are like, you know, massive. I, so sage is a type of plant you can cut, you can almost take to the ground, and it'll just come back up. And it's, for, for non-eating, for non-herbal sage, it is one of the first plants that will flower in our area. So if you're trying to bring pollinators to your yard, having an autumn sage, um, one or two near your yard, is the best way to bring bees in right away in the spring. They always, we always talk about plants so you have flowers going throughout the year. It's the first plant to flower and it's the, and it's the last plant to end up flowering. It, it'll flower into November so um, it's a great smell, it's a great taste, and this is the one from my garden, so I, I keep it pretty well. It, it's about yay big, and I just keep pruning it back so it doesn't get overpowering to my other plants. And then tarragon. Um, French tarragon is also a wood, woody, it's low spreading plant. Um, it's one of the few herbs that we have that does not produce a seed, so it propagates through its, its root cuttings. Um, and it will also send off shooters, so that's how you can actually prop, repropagate if you wanna put it someplace else. As, as soon as that, that new growth is strong enough, you can cut it off so that there's enough root system and replant it. Um, I like putting this in a pot because of the, of the root systems. Um, it has a unique, spicy, sharp, aromatic flavor. It's, um, and, and, it, and then it has some overtones of mint and licorice. So its flavor is very dominant. A little goes a long way when you're cooking with it. And so you have to really think about what flavors you wanna add. It's great for stews um, and it goes good with almost every, <coughs> excuse me, um, meat that you can think of. I also like using tarragon to make um, vinegars and oils. It's a, it's because it's got such a strong flavor, a couple twigs in some um, very light olive oil. You have some wonderful flavors with that. And it is the essential ingredient for Bernays sauce if you like to make Bernays sauce, which has no calories, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was the tarragon that doesn't have any calories. <laughs> um, thyme, uh, another one of my favorite. It's, um, again, another low growing. It's sort of like tarragon and thyme to me are equivalent in how they grow and how, almost how they look, uh, although they, uh, their leaves are slightly different. Um, their flavor becomes, the flavor of thyme is uh, more delicate when air dried. 
Um, and in this one case, they say don't take the leaves off the stems after you dry them. Let the, save the whole sprig because the essential oils stay more intact because the leaves are attached to the sprig. So you're going to dry it like you do normally, but then take the sprigs and just put them in a plastic bag and take a sprig out, take the leaves off when you're ready to use it, rather than put, taking all the leaves off and putting them in a little container. Um, it has a clove-like flavor, um, very strong. So this is one that you use a quarter of a teaspoon versus a teaspoon, and um, except for the lemon thyme, and that is obviously with the word lemon has a much lighter, airier, um, and you can use a little bit more of it. I use my lemon thyme mostly in fish dishes, um, something that, and chicken. It's a it's a lighter taste. It's great um, in melted butter over carrots um, and, and types of shellfish. And uh, one of the things at the end, we're going to talk about making butter. And this is a great uh, herb to make, uh, put in your butter, whip butter. Would thyme be something to put in a garden bed? Or would it I have mine in, um, well, I have mine. Would it overtake? No, it, it it's pretty contained. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you, you think about layering your garden, you want your taller plants in the back, medium and then low, it's in my front of my garden bed because it's so low. Gotcha. Now, any plant that you don't trim back, you will, it will take over. So my herbs are there to eat. So I'm, I'm usually using it. In fact, I have to worry about taking too much off because I don't want to disturb a plant. And you know, the nice thing about herb gardens is rabbits don't theoretically like to eat herbs because they don't like the taste. Um, I have two rabbits who have proved me wrong on that. So um, I think all of you have seen my pictures of my cages. I've now gone to plexiglass because everybody's selling plexiglass for 50% off because COVID isn't here anymore. So all those plastic sheets that we had between you and the cashier. Um, Home Depot was selling them at 50% off. So I've made in my raised garden beds, my rock, brick rock garden beds, I put the plexiglass along the edge, just put steel rods in to hold them in place. So you can see your garden. Um, the rabbits and squirrels can't get in. It's only two feet high. And it, it's a prettier sight for me. And it's kept everything out that I want out and I can just move a panel out if I want to go in and, and garden. So just a thought, an, another cage type item. Um, thyme is, works really well with parsley. Um, you'll see a lot of recipes that have parsley and thyme together but their, their flavors complement. This is something you'll see in your turkey stuffings and um, your soups and stews. So I think it's an essential for your garden. And then we have just generally other black yard herbs, and I just want to make sure we have time. We have plenty of time. So we talked a little bit about fennel before. Um, that it looks somewhat like a dill. It has that mild licorice -y flavor, um, which I love cooking with. And you can eat the seeds, the flowers, the bulbs. So it's a plant that goes a long way. Uh, lavender, I have lavender more in my bee gardens because I love the flower and the smell, and I do take the flowers and crush it, and it's, it's a, a scent in the house that, that just lightens the air. Um, but I have dishes that call for lavender, um, and mostly it's dessert dishes that I cook that, that require the lavender. So um, I don't cook with it as much, but it's a great plant to have, and when you do want it, it it's there. Um, the most popular varieties of lavender for herbs um, are shortbread and vodka. So it's got to say something good if it has the word vodka in it. Um, and this, to dry it, this takes a couple weeks to dry, but you're, you're picking the sprigs off, bundling them, and drying them. They also, a little bit tend like rosemary, if you get them over dried, the, the, I would call them more like needles become hard. So use the same practice that 
before they get fully dried, if you're going to crush them, uh, that would be a good time to put them in your grinder. Um, savory, and the word savory means just robust taste, is another great herb um, to grow. It's got bushy fragrant leaves. It goes about 10 inches high. It's a great to blend in with your flower garden or herb garden. And I have flowers blended in with this so it's not just green plants. Um, summer savory is an annual um, and winter savory is a perennial. Um, the best time to plant the perennials like this is September, like I, th I think I said earlier, so that the root systems have time to take hold before the winter comes in. Um, both of the savory plants are, are spreading compact. I have not had a lot of experience. I, I buy savory at the store, but I have not grown it, so I don't know what its root systems do with the rest of your garden. Um, it has a peppery flavor and a grassy fragrance. So, and again, I, when I cook, I have these sensations of taste and smell, and I haven't put that one in my portfolio yet, so. Um, so now you've got all these herbs, you're cooking with them on a regular basis, but you have more herbs than you know what to do with. So one thing is making your herb bouquets. Bouquet is, is for your cooking and you can, and I have a couple, you know, just basic herb bouquet is a standard is parsley sprigs, thyme sprigs, and a bay leaf tied together. You th in this, because of the way you're tying it, you don't have to put it in cheesecloth. But we also have a dried herb bouquet, and when you're doing that, you need to put it in a cheesecloth or something that you don't have the herbs. Now, into your stew that you need to take out, or your soup. So um, you can add cloves, black pepper, lemon peel, oregano, basil, and to either one of these, and again, it goes back to what flavors are you trying to bring out? I would use something with the lemons and oreganos, probably with fish dishes or chicken dishes. And then my favorite part um, of the holiday is making herb vinegars and oils. So the best herbs that work for this, and you can probably try your own if you think about it, but we have lemon thyme, rosemary, sweet basil, uh, thyme, dill, and garlic, and then um, Chives also do work, but they, it takes a lot longer to, for me to permeate what I'm, I'm doing. So you want something that has a stronger flavor to get into the vinegars and the oils. Make sure when you're making them, I, I go to thrift stores and I buy really funky, unique bottles, but you have to sterilize them and because you don't want to bring bacteria in for what you're storing. Um, Everything here is based on a pint. My bottles are typically two pints, so you just multiply out. So generally, you can make some vinegars with the red wine, but most of them call for a clear, the clear vinegar, the apple cider vinegar, or the white vinegar, um, and just more because of color and the essence. Um, but basically, a couple, say two sprigs to a pint, and in three to four weeks, you have um, of a flavored vinegar. Olive oil takes longer. Um, I love putting um, basil in the olive oil um, and I use very extra virgin light olive oil because you don't want the olive oil to have the heaviness. You want to have your herbs that you're putting in to, to be able to permeate. Do you use uh, fresh herbs in your cooking? Yes. Okay. Yep. So yep. And um, so when I do my oils, I will start into September to have them ready for holiday gifts in December. And they last. It's not like you have to use them right away, but if you really want to give something that's usable right away. And you know, you buy, go buy some gift tags and label what it is, but um, all of these, and the, this one is one that I've used, the lemon mint vinegar recipe. Um, putting the spiral of lemon down into the bottle, um, some currants, and um, it says sprigs of mine. It must be mint. <laughs> ah, an error. I'll fix that. Um, and then put, 
put your herbs in the bottle first and then fill it because otherwise you'll be, as you're sticking them in, every, the, the liquid will be coming out, if that makes sense. Um, herb butter is a fun thing to do. Um, here you're going to take a, a good butter um, and because some of the cheaper butters are too watery so when you're, when you're um, mixing them they become liquidy along the way. So um, pick, pick whatever kind of um, herb you like and uh, tarragon works really great with butter. Chopped chives works really great. And then whip it. And then I like to roll it and put it in a plastic, you know, just plastic saran wrap and then cut it off. And you can, then you can take your cuts and as you're cooking, say, fish or even like meats, right around the time you're done, you put the slab of it on and it melts with the, with the herbs in it. It's delicious. But these are fun gifts to make. It's something to do with your herbs that are one off. Um, and for the holidays, it's, it's a great idea. And that's it. Um, I, what I do is I send it to um, Ava and sh you guys. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. And I don't know why this peeps popping up. Anything else? So for winter. Uh-huh. How how much do you have to water? Like always tell you to stop watering everything, you know, in the winter. Um well, if it's in the house you're watering regularly. I don't I typically don't water anything in the in the winter. Um unless I'm specifically growing something that I like my spinach when I plant it, I will I will lightly spray it, but maybe once a week. You, the ground, because it's not, the heat's not, ev it's not evaporating because of the heat, all right? Um, out of courtesy, um, a lot of the information I got was from the University of Arizona growing herbs for the health of it. Um, th these bulletins are available on the University of Extension website, which you can go to. Um, I had it at the beginning. Um, also, there's one called Food Preservation that talks a lot more detail about um, canning, freezing, drying. And then uh, Ken Lane from Waters Garden Center always has a variety of information, and I like to give him credit because I use a lot of his information. And lastly, the University of Arizona Extension Office is an equal opportunity provider, which means that we are here to serve everybody. And our extension email address is extension.arizona.edu. And if you go to that as a person that's an outsider, it'll take you right to a lot of the information I just talked about, plus all the past uh, Zoom presentations that we've made. So any questions? Thank you for coming tonight, even with the rain. <laughs>